Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, happy Friday and welcome to our um, release recap for August. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm going to start us off with talking about USAS and um, the different releases that we had last month um, for that. So um, just to go ahead and kick us right off, there were three different releases that came out in the month of August. Uh, we had two regular releases and then a hot fix that was like right at the start of August. Um, and we'll talk about what was specifically was on that one. Um, just jumping right into the bug fixes, we had this first one was correcting the ability to use the create new feature um, on the refund transactions. And um, what was happening is uh, previously, it was just if they, you know, the create new is they're adding a refund, they have that window open and just in the top, they could click create new. And when they save that first refund, it would just automatically open a new blank window so they can continuously enter like a group of them at one time. So just in that specific situation, if they were doing that, if the first refund had a check, then it was holding the check information. So they kind of couldn't use that feature. Now they can, that's corrected. Um, so that was included um, on one of the August releases. And then um, the next one is, this one's about the hotfix. So um, with the release of 8.52, there was an unintentional bug. Um, if you remember back from July, the very last release there, we made some um, major improvements to the purchase order process. Um, we did some stuff in the background so that a lot of the things that happen throughout the expenditure process can be much quicker. And so we had some really um, big improvements there as far as performance goes. This one, um, it was an effect from that that was just any purchase orders that were getting created. There was a date that was kind of used in the background that was showing up on the XMLs that was incorrect. So we got out a hotfix ASAP to correct that, um, also included in that hotfix. It went and looked for the purchase orders that were created during that, that window between the release and the hot fix, and then it automatically patched those purchase orders. Um, and so that covers, you know, the original bug and the patch. Okay, and then we get to move on to the improvements. So um, this first one here, we implemented the ability to print um, 1099s, miscellaneous, and NEC on the pressure seal forms. So we've been making some updates along the way in USAS to start preparing for this ability to be able to print directly from USAS. And the printer sealer copies, like these are the ones that, you know, go on the standard forms um, that usually get mailed out. So uh, here's where you'll see it, and we'll look at this one in the software, um, but here's where you'll see it is on the 1099 extract um, in the output file type is the printer sealer copies option. And let me go ahead, um, switch over to my little demo instance. So this is under the periodic menu in the 1099 extracts. And so right here, printer sealer copies. Now, as far as the other information on this page, this is gonna go uh, just kind of like how it's been in the past with, you know, the other formats that you would create the 1099 extracts, you know, you do have the option to select NEC or miscellaneous. Um, I have some notes that, <clears throat> excuse me, are on, uh, the release recap page. So if you're looking at that, you know, if you have that for reference, like I'm gonna, just going to talk through these additional notes, but they are they are actually like listed on there. Um, so the first thing is with um, the 1099 NEC and miscellaneous, these are checkboxes. So if I want to do the printer sealer copies, like I can select miscellaneous or I can select NEC. Right, right this moment, if you select both, it's going to mix them together which we definitely understand that that's probably not what you want for printing because they they print on two different forms. Like you don't want to have to like switch them back and forth in the printer. So um, we have a JIRA issue that would, if, if both are selected, then it would actually separate the files for you um, or something like that. But right now, 
uh, you want to just select one or the other, like if you're going to do any test printing. So uh, just like one at a time so you can get the separate files. Um, let's see. And then I'm going to do a test here, but just as far as the other information on this page, so all of this, you know, works just the same as it does when you're creating like the IRS format or, you know, if you created the PDF, um, like you used to, you have all of the information that goes on here. Um, the report gives you just like actual report for reference and then generate submission file is what you would do to actually generate the output file that you chose. So if we select this here, so I did, um, this is the, the 1099 miss. I selected that first. So it gives me the miss. And then here, let me do a little zoom here for us. And, you know, it just populates information. So, you know, it looks at the vendors that qualify. It looks at the vendors that, you know, would qualify for miscellaneous versus NEC. And then it's going to go through and enter the information here. Um, the next note that I have is that um, we did find that if the vendor, if the vendor's like contact info is in like mixed case, so it's not all in upper or lower case, then it then it's currently printing on the 1099 that way. Um, but we are going to correct that uh, so that it would be um, all capital letters. So that's another update we have. Um, as well as if the vendor name is like more than 25 characters, like then it, it needs to be um, truncated, I believe. So um, yeah, so I have, it won't display properly on the printed document. So I assume that means we'll truncate that, but um, our development team has been testing these, has been reviewing these with like a fine tooth comb. So uh, there are still some updates we're planning to make, but this is, you know, the first big step of getting this out here uh, to be able to print. And here, let me just go ahead. I'll do a NEC form real quick so you can see that. Okay. And um, the last note I have is a reminder that SSDT is supporting one blank pressure seal form um, for each of the 1099 types. And those that type is noted on the page, but it's a eight and a half by 11 Z fold is what we are supporting um, with this format because this is you know this will it's like uh set you know with the formatting the boxes everything to um to print that form okay so let me get back to our recap over here so here is all those notes i just went over and then the next thing I have, so this is a really exciting one. I know a lot of districts really wanted this. Um, it's the ability to change a vendor on a new PO without reopening the posting period associated with the PO date. So, you know, um, this has come up before because, um, you know, they created the PO a couple months ago. The period's closed now. They realize that it's the wrong vendor. Um, I know this can happen a lot, you know, especially like, Districts have requisitions and, you know, the person that's putting in the requisition isn't necessarily the person paying it. So it gets to the part where they're going to pay it and they realize they picked the wrong vendor with the wrong address. And I know that a lot of districts, you know, definitely don't want to go back and be reopening periods for that. So, um, so with changing the vendor, we did update this. So now it can be changed without um, opening that prior period. Um, the one thing, so this uses the repair option. I'm going to show this. And um, the PO repair option, it does have, uh, it, so this basically works, you know, other than the posting period in the same way that the repair option um, like has worked, which in that case, it's, um, you can't change it to a multi-vendor PO. Like you can change it to a new vendor, but it's like, that would be like changing it to a blank. So that option isn't available yet. Um, we did hear some feedback on this, that that's something that would be wanted is to be able to change it to a multi-vendor PO. So we do have a feedback issue to track that um, for like a future enhancement request. Uh, so let's look at this right now. Oh, and in my recap page, uh, this is a link. I just want to point this out, the repair option on the PO. This links to the exact section um, that is in the uh the wiki that goes over you know the other like the details of this repair option so just in case there's anything like that you want to refresh on um you know if they're going to be using it for 
um, changing vendors. So I'm going to purchase orders. And like, and I guess one thing I just want to say is, you know, so with that repair option, like there are certain rules. So like we can only use the repair option on like outstanding POs, you know, which, which makes sense. I mean, it seems like the situation they're going to use it, like they don't want to change a vendor after a PO has been paid to a vendor. Right. So, um, so that's what I mean with looking at the repair option, like it kind of spells out, um, you know, what those, what those situations are. Um, okay. So this is my PO that I want to look at. I'm going to click the view option. So I want to just view it. And, uh, so this one, it is a vendor, um, Centerville medical supplies. And then darn it, I was going to go to my posting periods first to show you. Let me just go back here. Let's just double, double check. Look at the posting periods. I want to show you that June is in fact closed and July is open and current. Now back to the POs. Okay, so we're picking this PO that is dated June 1st. So we know that this is in a closed period. Um, Centerville Medical Supplies, and I'm gonna use this repair option. Click on vendor tab. And then I have my drop down, so I can go ahead and um, just pick a different vendor from here. And that one, okay. Um, and then I'll pick this one. Go ahead and update it. <laughs> And um, so as with the repair option, this is another really nice part of this, um, this feature is that it gives you this little recap of changing it. And then you can also print the results as well. So you even get a little report. So if they want to keep track of changing this vendor, um, I mean, of course it would be audited, but you know, just for their records, they can also get this nice little report showing that they changed it, what date and time they changed it, um, and that sort of thing. So. Once I do that, now my vendor is changed, I can go ahead and invoice and continue with paying on this vendor. Um, any questions on those new, on um, either of the improvements? Yeah. Yeah, I'll pass along that feedback, Rhonda. I know, I know that this is gonna make a lot of districts very happy. Okay, well, the last thing I have, we have been making some internal updates. This is just stuff that's being updated in the background to prepare for like future, um, you know, future updates as far as the software, keeping everything, um, you know, up to date as, you know, things like evolve um, as far as versions and stuff like that. So internally, we created service layers for cash reconciliation. Um, we did some testing um, with different changes and then, you um, civil proceedings and scenarios. So um, again, these are just internal um, updates, no impact to the current pages uh, that are listed for any of these. Um, so not something that you'll see any difference in as far as the software, um, just so that you know that those are things we're working on kind of in the background. Um, okay, well, that's all I have for you, SAS. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you know, definitely let me know. But um, I think we are ready to switch over to USPS. Okay. okay. So make sure you can see the right screen here. Can you see me now? <laughs> or my screen? Yeah, we're seeing the, US, uh, the USPS application. Okay, awesome. So you're seeing that one. Okay, great. So it should be all set. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Welcome to the payroll um, releases. I hope you're having a good Friday so far. Um, first thing we'll be going over is um, we'll be having two regular um, bug fixes that we had, and then we also had two hot fixes in August also. So not too much um, anything fixes that we had um, for the month of August. So the first one we'll go through was the uh, bug fix. Um, this was the first um, regular um, release that we had. Um, and this was just to correct a query 
um, a district had an employee that had multiple missed deductions that they had a that deduction was set up as max. And when the employee finally had enough money to um, deduct um, and catch up, the system um, in the background was still adding those missed deductions to that max amount. So they were thinking that it had met its, um, its limit and it wouldn't deduct anymore. So that was a fix, a bug that we had corrected. Um, and it was so far, it was only one district that had caught that, but probably could have had more in the future. So we fixed that. Um, the next one was in payroll when they were removing a pay group from a payroll when they were initializing and then um, adding or removing a payroll group, um, it was showing an error for some reason. And that was a bug behind the scenes um, or when they were trying to remove that pay group, it just wasn't updating. Um, so that was a bug fix. Um, the next one would be our hot fix, which would have been our first one on August 12th. Um, this was both released on the 6.72. It was introduced, and I'm assuming probably all ITCs probably had a district or two that probably had this problem when they were trying to initialize payroll. Um, it was throwing errors like crazy. Um, so we had to do a lot of fixing that day and probably on Saturday to get these districts moving so they could finish their payroll. So that was a correction that we did. And then also, I believe um, in that error or in that um, uh, release, we had also um, payroll report. They were having issues with that, was preventing them from completing the pay report. So that was all fixed um, in that hot fix. So hopefully we don't ever run into that again. The next one was the next hot fix, which is August 16th and the ABS1 report. Um, we were having districts, um, some employees at the district were running the ABS 101 report, and for some reason, it was preventing them from running the report. Now, another person could run it and it would be fine. And what we were seeing was it was um, the save and recall um, on that report when they were running it. And it also was, um, if it was trying to find employees that had no adjustments or accumulation for that time period, um, it was just throwing an error. It wouldn't even complete. Um, so now they fixed that and it won't throw error anymore if they can't, if the report can't find an, a given employee for adjustments to accumulations, it would just send a blank report if no employees are found. So that was a correct uh, correction on that hot fix for that bug. Um, the next one was the employer distributions. Um, it was how some districts use alphanumeric um, characters in their payroll accounts. So example, like 905B, some districts don't use the alpha in there and some do. And for some reason, some of them were, were going through fine in the mapping, but some were being caught and then throwing a bug. So when they were trying to run it, they were having issues. So they were able to find that bug in that mapping configuration and they updated that and corrected that. So now when they're running the employer distribution, they should not have any more um, errors being thrown if they have the alpha in their numbers, count numbers. Okay, the next will come down to improvements. So now we have, they did some work on um, the ABS 101 report and they were able to get that improved by 90% improvement run. So that's that's quite quite a bit. The next one was the pay report performance that jumped up between 19 and 29 percent improvement. The next improvement they had it um, was request for some ITCs and districts that um, they add the archive, the file archive for the audit reports. Um, they the USB standard didn't have or group manager didn't have this. So it, they, it was not being completed and going over to the file archive when they were running the AOS and S SLC one reports in the, um, so when they did that, um, they added the audit report view automatically to USB standard. And then the group manager automatically has the view create an update now. So now they shouldn't have any issues in that when running um, or setting up that, uh, job scheduler for that file archive. 
The next one is uh, they added a distinction between the property properties and new contract. We're having a lot of issues where they couldn't tell what was the old compensation and new compensation on the new contract grid. So now when they go to new contract, they're gonna see a little the grid a little differently. Now you're gonna see where is this coming from? It's pulling from the old number, the old last name, old first name of the contract. You can see new label, new description. So that's all part of the new. So now they can go to more and they can add all more old compensation fields in the report or in the grid. And if they scroll down further towards the bottom, you're gonna see the new compensations. So now they can add or take off uh, what fields, columns that they wanna see. And then if they wanna run a report, um, they can do that now and it will include those headers and they can verify to make sure that their figures are showing correctly. So now it should be a little easier to distinct what is old and what was coming and what is coming from the new, con new contract. So I think districts are gonna like that. And that, that's going to be for mid-year contracts changes too. So that would be both. Okay, the next one is stirs and stirs item. We're having a lot of districts where they were missing adding one or the other, either marking the retire flag and not putting the rehire date in or vice versa. So now when they go to payroll item and either 400, 450, doesn't matter which one, they're both set up um, to be caught. Now, if they go and they said, oh, okay, rehired, retiree, but I forgot to put the date in. So now if they go in and save, they're not gonna get any further. So they gotta put the uh, date in. Same thing goes for if you don't have the rehired, retire box checked, but if you have a date in, try to save it, it's gonna catch it. They're not gonna go any further. So I think this is gonna save them a lot of time in fixing um, in the future um, when they're running their reports and seeing um, problems because they didn't have one or the other um, marked. So again, that goes for both 400 and 450 record. So those errors are out there now. So they hopefully that will save the district some pain in the future. Um, the next one, um, this was the behind the scene performance. Um, and this was for the account mapping in the employer distributions. So um, that was just an improvement that they worked on. Um, really nothing to explain on that. It's just hopefully maybe it, or, um, they have um, the performance is a little better when they're running that. The next one is the EMIS change for fiscal year 23. So this, this uh, fiscal year right now we're in the position. They added some fields for the separation. So they add a position separation and also this can be loaded by mass load position if they do it that way. Those are out there in documentation. They added a redesign. Number four took a job outside of the field of ed education. And also number seven had been added and this is resign unknown or does not fit into the options of four, five or six. So again, this will be under positions. Just pick an employee here and right here, separation reason. So if they go here, you're gonna see number four has been added, then also number seven. So now they can choose from um, not equitable to all the way down to number nine either of those now, what suits that employee when they leave. Okay, the next one is the add warning to the EMIS configuration. Um, we were having some districts that were changing it either too soon or not changing it and, um, and it was causing problems. So now they put a catch in there. Um, if they're gonna, it, it actually is a warning. So I believe it will, let you go through, save it, but um, it is a warning. And in system configurations, EMI reporting right here. So if they try to change this date or anything too soon and they're still in reporting period, it's gonna throw a warning. 
So now if they're, the system has to be in the date between May 1st and August 31st. So it's the system date, the date, like today's date. So I can't test, I can't show you that that warning will pop up because we're out of this time frame right now. So that you won't get a message if you're trying to change that between May 1st and August 31st, you won't get that message. But if you are trying to change that date, you're in between these two, uh, May 1st and August 31st, you're going to get a warning. Changing the EMS reporting year between May 1st and August 31st will impact final staff course in reporting of EMIS data. So they just want to make sure before they change that that's what they want to do. So I think that will be very helpful also. Okay. Um, the next one is the new contract report. There is an improvement on this one where um, when they were trying to do run the new contract report under reports, um, it was pulling in the, if they, and they were changing a pay group for that new contract from that employee's old contract to the new um, with the pay group. For some reason, that new contract report was only pulling in that previous contract pay group. It was not wanting to pull in what that new contract pay group that they had changed it to was not being caught. So now that's been improved. And now when they run that report, if they did change that pay group for that compensation, now it will show the new pay group on there and not the old. So, so those were some of the improvements that we had done. Um, any questions on any of the releases uh, for the month of August? Like I said, it wasn't too many this time, so. Okay, um, I am hoping you have a great Friday. Um, I will send it on to Michelle for the inventory releases. All right. Okay, so we are going to discuss um, <clears throat> the two releases that went out in the month of August. And uh, we had 121 and 122. And so we'll touch upon um, the bug fixes first, and then we'll go through the improvements. Um, and this over here. Is there questions? Okay. Um, so the bug fixes. Um, we did have a situation where, um, when creating a new fiscal year underneath for fiscal year, um, it wasn't um, checking to see if a valid fiscal year value was being entered in. So if I fat fingered and put in 2023-3. Um, it was allowing that. So we fixed that. Um, so it, it only allows you to put in a valid year. Uh, the core fiscal year also, we corrected a problem with the closing process um, with the beginning balances. Um, when closing for the year, the beginning balances for the new year weren't being updated properly. So that was resolved as well, I believe on 121. Um, two bug fixes on the reports, uh, the brief asset listing, the report was failing to generate when you entered in a specific organization. Um, so if I go into the brief asset report here and I selected a specific organization underneath the selection options and I put in a specific you know, or organization code, it was failing to generate. So we did uh, go in and, and fix that. And also underneath um, the reports, the audit report, um, we refactored that report to exclude those initial import entries that took up pages and pages and pages. When you think about all of the items you know, loaded in, it was tracking all of those um, to show that they were imported in. Um, so they had refactored that, and that also helped to improve the report generation performance. I know we've had a couple of tickets about having issues um, when closing with the reports. And so I know those have been addressed and they're, and they're working on them or they've already resolved them. So if your districts are you know, um, going in and ready to close 22 um, and they're having problems with um, the report generation and things like that, the report bundle is taking too long or something like that, um, you know, please submit a ticket and we'll take a look at that. So those were the bugs fixes that we had. Um, we did finally get a chance to make some bigger improvements.
improvements in inventory after um, having quite a few bug fixes for the last few releases. Um, and so these are pretty exciting ones. Um, and they're you know related. Um, some of them are related to fiscal year end. Um, the first thing that we did is we did add a depreciation uh, transaction area in the item record. So I'm going to go back in and go into items here. And I'm just going to go in and I'm going to go into edit. Um, I can't do anything with posting a depreciation adjustment unless I'm in the edit option. I'm just going to click on edit on this particular tag. And I'm going to scroll down to the depreciation information. And here, the depreciation transactions, this is the new adjustment area. Um, what we did is we restricted um, people to go in and just modify the life to date depreciation. With new districts starting in and being able to, that weren't migrating, and being able to go in and load um, data for multiple years and stuff, um, we had to make the change um, regarding life to date depreciation and how that gets affected and updated. So, you know, we thought, you know, in USAS, we have budget adjustments. So, if they need to go in and make an adjustment on their expendable figures, they can do an adjustment there. Let's do the same type of um, you know, thing with inventory is, you know, if there needs to be a change made on the life to date depreciation, they can post a depreciation adjustment or transaction um, to, uh, to update that life to date depreciation amount. Now, I know some of you are probably asking, well, you do have that depreciate um, option on the grid. And yes, that will go in and allow you to select multiple ones and it will just recalculate depreciation. But if there is something specific that needs to be addressed, maybe something with the auditor saying, you know, your life to date depreciation is off by $1,500, you need to post a depreciation adjustment, then this is the way to do it. You need to go in and edit the item and actually go in and create a depreciation adjustment. So if I go ahead and click on this, um, you'll notice that um, it, creates a row and the fiscal year is going to be the current year that I'm in. So if I have 22 open and 23 open, but 23 is also my current period, then it's gonna to default to 23. And so the type is just going to default to adjustment. And then I'll, I can go in, this is optional. I can go in and put in a, a description. So per auditor's request on this date, I'm increasing it by $5,000. Um, and then I put in my amount and then I click on save. So it is not going to overwrite the current life to date. It's going to add or subtract. So I can put in a positive or a negative amount here. So if I just put in $5,000 in here and click on save, it will increase my life to date by $5,000. So it'll be 28, 604, 46. Um, if I put in a negative 5,000, it will decrease it by $5,000. So that's basically how that works. And so if I then go in after I post this adjustment and I change my current period to 22 and I go back into this item, I can't um, edit or delete that adjustment because it was made in 23. I would have to go back and make 23 current and then, you know, make the adjustment or delete it. You know, if I did something incorrect, I had the wrong amount or something, or I was on the wrong tag entirely, and I just want to delete it. I have to go back to that current period and edit it or remove it. So that's basically what that um, depreciation transaction is all about. And the documentation has been updated to discuss that and, and go into detail what you need to do. Just go ahead and excite it here for that. Um, okay, uh, the next thing that we um, added was a new report, and this was in regards to fiscal year end. Classic, um, their EIS closed program that closed the fiscal year created two reports. Um, and one of the reports was called the EIS closed, EISCLS.txt, which basically showed a projection of what the ending balance is 
their original cost amounts would be for that year that they're closing. So it's kind of a, like a projection report, if you will. Um, and so we have created that same report in redesign now. So if I go back in here, that's all out of here. I go up to reports. Here is the fiscal year and balancing report. So that's where it's located. And it's just going to run for the year. There are no options or anything. When you go in here, it's just my current year is 23. And it's going to generate a report of the projections of that year. Um, so that's basically what that report is. It's included in the inventory report bundle. Um, and I know we do have one more report that needs to be generated um, from the EIS close. And that was the EIS DEP.txt. It was the depreciation projection report. Um, and that's going to be, I believe, on the next, or that, that was on the last release. I just haven't updated the documentation yet. So that was on the 123. Um, so that's not out there yet in the documentation, but um, that's the other report that still needs to be done in regards to the fiscal year end. Um, other improvements we made, we made some improvements to our system configuration menu. So in inventory, and I know sometimes this gets confusing, we have a core configuration. And that basically is EIS's um, maintenance um, debt screen. Um, but we also have a system configuration as well. And that's the one I'm talking about where we've made some changes. Um, we had the ADS config. That was the only option we had in there for a while. And then you'll notice that we have several more that have been added. So they've been busy with this. And one of them, like I said, is this password configuration. And this is modeled after um, USAS, um, the same thing when it comes to passwords. And if, they, if the district wants to change up or with the ITC um, change up, you know, the minimum length of the password to log into the inventory, if you want to require numeric and, you know, all the same type of options that you would available in the other applications. So that was added um, in August. And um, we also added the report bundle. And I'll get back to the config menu here in a little bit. Um, so we've got the inventory fiscal year report bundle out there. And this is the replacement for classics EISCD. And you know, we did talk to um, the steering committee, we did talk to the inventory focus group that we had as to. What reports do we need out there? Do we need all flavors of the classic 305, you know, an EIS CD, all flavors of the 304? And everyone was like, yes, let's put them all out there. Um, so that's what we did. And so there are, I think, um, 26 reports that it generates, including um, the audit report. So it's a pretty hefty amount of reports and large reports on this. Um, the big difference here compared to the other applications is that we don't have a file archive in inventory right now. And so this is going to be emailed um, to the person that closes the year. So, or should I say, the user that closes the year may be different from the person that the reports are going to be emailed to, okay? So that user if they go in, like you have your inventory um, clerk at the district, closes the year, and that's fine. They go ahead and close it. But when they closed it, the email that it's sent to is the treasurer and maybe their auditors. Um, and that's fine because what happens then is that gets sent to those specific people in a zipped format, all of those reports that they can then unzip and store on their uh, computers. Um, so let's go into details about all, how all of this gets set up here. Um, so I'm gonna go into um, our documentation that explains this. So with, um, and we've got this underneath the reports option. Um, if I, I'm just gonna go back to our main reports option, the documentation where we have our gap, our non-GAAP reports, and then the inventory report bundle. So that's where this documentation is stored. And 
before um, you know you run before you close the year, um, you need to set up a few things. So you need to set up an email configuration. So this information needs to be um, set up beforehand before you close. If you close and the reports didn't get generated, that's okay. Set up this information, reopen the year, and reclose, and they'll get email. Um, so what needs to be set up here? Um, in core configuration, email addresses need to be entered in. So if I go back to my instance here, and I'm going to go into core and go into configuration, it's this new field right here that's been added. So you can go in and enter in um, one or more email addresses in here. Um, and so those people then will get that zipped file of all the inventory reports. And then the other thing that needs to be addressed is underneath the system configuration, there's an email config option in there now that needs to be installed and populated as well. And inventory admin roles required for this. So this is the ITC that will need to help out with this and make sure that that gets um, installed because there are certain fields in there that need to be entered in by the ITC. Um, so I'm just gonna go back and show you where that's at. So underneath system configuration, we were just in here a little bit ago talking about the password config. It's this email config. So if it hasn't been installed yet, you'll first get an option saying install it. When you click on that, then it brings up this menu. And this is where the ITC may have to put in information um, that's specific to that ITC, their host and their port, things like that. Um, so that needs to be addressed. And then, like I said, port configuration, the actual email address needs to be entered in. So once those two things are taken care of, um, then um, the, when we close the year, that report bundle is going to be generated and emailed. So I just have some screenshots here of what that looks like. And so um, the email will include the zipped file as an attachment. So um, when they you know, get that email and it has it as an attachment with the zipped file, they'll just download that attachment. So they're going to download that and it defaults to a compressed zipped folder. So they're all in this zipped folder first. And so here, once I download it, you'll see what it looks like um, in my downloads folder. So it's just a, a file folder in here. And then from here, I can just open the contents. And that's based on your browser settings. For me, I just double click. I am on Chrome and it just double clicked the folder and then it displayed all of the reports in PDF format. Um, and like I said, it's recommended that these are saved and stored because when we get the document management and archival project available, they'll be able then to go in and upload those into that system. So, um, so that's kind of how that, um, uh, goes. I mean, that's how that's generated. You know, once you get those config options entered in, it closed the year, it sends the report bundle, they sit on those. Um, you know, they can also um, take that zipped file. If they didn't put their auditor's email address in the configuration, they can forward it to them. And then they've got all the reports as well. Um, down here is just a list of all the reports that are included and their EIS CD equivalent. So this might be a good thing to share with the auditor so they can see, you know, I'm looking for that, you know, 304 report of just the acquisitions for the year. It's in here. Um, and so this might be a good reference area for um, the auditors. Okay, any questions about um, the improvements made in August? Okay. Um, just a couple other things before we sign off. Um, one thing is training that's coming up. Uh, we don't have any other Fridays with fiscal trainings in September because we're all gearing up for OEDSA. Um, and I'm hoping you all are attending. Um, it's going to be a great conference this year. 
And with SSDT, we are doing four different sessions in there. Um, and so we're gonna be located in a different area this year. We don't all have to get our uh, walking shoes on and hike all the way around to the other side of the hotel this year. We're up close <laughs> by where you guys registered last year. Um, and so I'm gonna scroll down. We're gonna be in the Gemini B and C room. We're combining those rooms together, uh, together because we have quite a few people that um, are going to be attending the fiscal sessions. And so in there we have, um, Roy Miller's gonna um, do a presentation on being accountable in payroll. Um, so it's gonna be talking about how the accounts and how the important role that they play in USPSR. And then Amanda is going to discuss reports and basically um, how the most efficient and effective way to run those. And um, we also have, uh, just a side note here, um, EMA staff reporting. Teresa Williams and Sandy Spark from NCOCC are going to be doing a session talking about um, the EMA staff reporting errors. And so we made that a combined session. And it's uh, so we won't really have anything in the fiscal track during that time. It'll be in another room um, to accommodate probably the large number of people that are going to be in there. So um, fiscal people will be um, attending that session. Um, SSDT also has. Um, a focus on filters. Amanda's going to be doing that one, talking about account filters and um, discussing how to use them in USASR. And then the last one we're going to do, um, I'm going to be doing an inventory update in there. Um, we have a lot of new people. Um, it's still new to many. And so I'm uh, just going to address FAQs and the fiscal year end related um, information and recent updates that we've made. Um, and we'll discuss that in there. Um, so, and as you can see, we have a lot of other wonderful um, sessions that we're going to be um, discussing. SGRS is coming, um, and so they're going to talk about some questions, and they're also going to make um, some time for both SSDT and eFinance to discuss, um, you know, how that uh, reporting information for fiscal year is related uh, to our software packages. So that's going to be a really good session. And also, um, we've got a treasurer coming in to talk about Excel tips and tricks. So, so yeah, so we got a lot of good stuff um, that's coming in uh, your way. So, um, also, and the most important thing, obviously, is Thursday night, uh, we are having a celebration of sunset, sunsetting classic, um, Thursday evening from 8 to 10. Um, so we're going to have a reception out in the back patio of the Houghton, which is beautiful. And so we are hoping you all can um, make it to that as well. And we'll just talk about um, classic, um, talk about, you know, the future of state software and just, you know, want to give everybody a pat on the back for doing such an incredible job um, migrating all of the districts. So I think it's, you know, something where we all, you know, just need to come together and give ourselves a pay on the back too for getting through it and surviving it. Um, so I'm excited about that. So can't wait to see you guys all there. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, we've got some more trainings coming up in November, in October and November and December, almost every Friday, we've got something going on in those months. So still a lot of training uh, to go, a lot of good information for you guys. And so we just appreciate everything. And um, if you guys don't have any, yes, you're right, Rhonda, what an amazing milestone. You guys all deserve a huge round of applause and a pat on the back for that. Um, but if you guys don't have any other further questions, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you on Alexa.